Ooh. What is up, producer friends? Uh, today I got a video, a oh, kind of weird video, um, but I thought it would be kind of fun to do. Got this handy dandy conch shell. Um, me and my family were on vacation somewhere, I think the Bahamas or something like that. We were just walking down this pier and I heard this guy like making this really ridiculously loud sound. And I look over and he's got this conch shell up to his lips. And what he does is he, he, he caught a bunch of conch shells, I guess. Caught conch shells? I don't know how you get conch shells, but he cut a hole out, if you can see that. He cuts a hole out of the top, and then basically you buzz your lips into this as if you were playing like a brass instrument, trombone, trumpet, something like that. And it makes this ridiculous, like, kind of foghorn kind of sound. So I figured we'd record that and see if we can make something, uh, something cool out of it. But first, before we get into that, uh, if you like content like this, you're a nerdy producer like me, then I highly suggest you subscribe to the channel. Uh, I post original music here, but I also do like weekly production videos about just interesting stuff. Sometimes I go into specific tutorials, but um, sometimes I just do weird stuff like recording conch shells. So it's kind of all over the place. But, you know, if you like music production stuff, then uh, definitely subscribe. That's uh, pretty much what I'm here for. Anyways, let's go ahead and get into it. Okay, here we are in Ableton, and I have the plain conch shell sound here. So probably not the best recording of it, but that's okay. I mean, I had to do it outside, so there's a little bit of background noise. Probably not the best mic positioning, but uh, I made it work. So let's go ahead and get into what I actually did. First, I'll play you the full sound that I got from it. So I think it turned out pretty good. Maybe not the most realistic kind of foghorn, but I think it works for like um, musical context. So let's go ahead and hop into the main sound here. I just have a group, essentially. You can ignore the rest of this stuff for now. So this main conch shell sound. So I will go through each one of these effects and kind of explain why I used each one and what kind of what my thinking was behind it. So the first thing I have here is an EQ, just taking out a little bit of the fundamental frequency. Because it was just a little too much, a little too muddy. Especially because I am running it into a saturator. Because you see here I have it pitched down 12 steps, one octave. And every time you pitch down some audio, you lose a little bit of the high end. So I'm kind of trying to combat that put a little bit of harmonic distortion in there to bring up some of those higher harmonics again. Next thing, I'm just cutting out a little bit of that 2K, a little bit of that, a little bit of that ringy fizzy uh, stuff that we don't want. Right, so pretty subtle, but it definitely makes a big difference uh, as I'm processing the sound further. The next thing I did was a little bit of a Haas effect thing because I wanted this one to sound real wide and, and thick. So simple Haas effect, uh, dry wet set to 47, time on the left channel set to about 10 milliseconds, time on the right channel about 20 milliseconds. Uh, feedback on zero. And with Haas effect, you always want to kind of worry about, you know, phasing issues and stuff like that. But we can quickly just check in mono. Seems like it's fine. So we will move along. Next, I have this group, which is doing most of the heavy lifting. So I have one channel in this group called dry, not being touched at all. The next one I have, I named it chorus, but I actually have a couple of things happening in this channel. So we will mute everything. First thing I have is corpus and you can hear what that is doing. It's very subtle, but it's bringing out a few of the higher harmonics. Kind of just wanted to make it sound a little bit more physical and a little bit more real. Corpus is really, really good for that. And you can see that I set it here to a, 
a D sharp, so it's bringing out the correct harmonics and not clashing. All right, so this chorus is doing a lot of the heavy lifting here. You can see I have it set to this little times 20 button, and that's essentially going to bring the rate up times 20 into like audio range. So it gets really, really fizzy, and you can actually tune it. Um, I'll show you kind of what that does. So you see how you can get it in tune like that? I really like that. It makes it super wide too. And I have the dry wet set to almost 75%. Next thing I have is just a really simple TAL chorus, a Juno chorus emulator, which is free. I highly recommend this plugin. It sounds freaking frick. And next I got an overdrive, just bringing up more of those higher harmonics. That's pretty much what this channel is for. Right? So that is just set to around the four or 5,000 uh, kilohertz range. And it's just doing a little bit, you know, each one of these is just incrementally bringing up those higher harmonics in different ways to get a, you know, unique kind of sound. Next, I got a reverb decay time set very, very low just for more stereo width, essentially. And, oh, I accidentally left this EQ on, which it's okay. It's basically just cutting out all of the fundamental frequencies. So without it, it sounds like this. So it cuts out the fundamental and a few of the harmonics after that um, because I really wanted this channel just to be the fizziness of the sound. Right, and I also knew that these harmonics down here... Um, I really wanted those to be taken up by this dry channel. So a good way to separate them is just with an EQ. So they're not um, phasing and, and getting kind of weird. And together they sound like this. So you can see it brings out a lot of like that breathiness, which I really like. The next thing I got is a reverb. which you can see I'm automating right at the very end. So it gives a long reverb tail. And I'm taking out some of the highs and some of the lows with the filter. I really wanted this reverb tail to be those mid frequencies. And um, I'll show you in a little bit kind of why I did that. It makes more sense in context. The last thing I'm doing is some EQ, taking out a little bit of 5K. Oh, it looks a little bit more like 4K actually. A slight dip uh, on all the highs, and then I'm dipping the fundamental frequency again quite heavily because that fundamental frequency sticks out a lot. And you can see here I'm running it into this plugin called G Clip, which is essentially just a limiting clipper kind of plugin. Um, softness set to 100 because I didn't want it to be like a hard digital clip kind of sound, but. If I kept this fundamental frequency in, it would start clipping it really, really hard. Um, so I'll show you kind of what that sounds like real quick. So you see how it gets like real muddy if I keep the fundamental frequency kind of where it's at without dipping it? It's just, it's too much. I need it to kind of be set back and not, um, not so in your face with that frequency. But I did want there to be really no dynamic range with this. I wanted it to be a big punch. So it's like a big foghorn right in your face. So that's the reason that I limited it here at the end. So that is the main conch sound. And the rest are kind of just filling in the gaps of this sound. That's how I like to do a lot of my sound design stuff is, is come up with one sound that sounds solid and then think, okay, where does it need to be uh, improved or added on and then pretty much just add layers from there. So I have this low conch sound, which I will take all of the effects off of. You can see I have it down, pitched down two octaves and that by itself sounds like this. So pretty fat, like some weird didgeridoo kind of thing. So the first thing I did was knock down the fundamental frequency of this one quite a bit. This was because I knew I wanted a sub layer underneath and I really didn't want it phasing with the sub layer. Right, so kind of just softening it up a little bit. And next I have the same reverb on it with the crazy tail. Um, yep, exact same reverb. 
And you can see in this one, I'm not doing anything to make it stereo wide other than the reverb. I wanted this one to be really mono. I wanted this one to be really, really solid in the middle. So it's kind of like the bass frequencies. So it's like you have a nice bassy foghorn in the middle. And then I wanted all the breathy, fizzy stuff on the sides. That was a good way to kind of visualize it. Next, I have an EQ doing very, very similar cuts. Taking out a lot of that sub bass, and then I'm just running it through the same clipper again. And I have a utility on here that's doing nothing, so let's delete it. Next, I got two more little fluffy layers in here. I got a left conch sound, which is panned completely to the left. And you can see on this one, I have chorus at 100%, just barely touching the amount, barely touching the rate and a good bit of reverb. On this reverb though, you can see I let a lot of the highs through. This was because I wanted that breathiness to ring out, right? So I wanted the breathiness on the sides to really, really ring out and the mids to kind of be in the middle as far as the reverb tails go. So you can hear. That reverb tail has a lot of high end energy in it. And the reason that I have this one pushed all the way to the left is because I have this one here pushed all the way to the right. Now, if I would have taken that exact same sample with that exact same processing and then duplicated it and just put it to the right, they would have just summed to be in the middle, right? Because stereo means that there's there's some different information happening in the right than there is in the left. So if I have the exact same information happening in the right as the left, they're going to sum and become just mono. So didn't want that, right? I wanted something that sounded wide, but what do I do if I'm using the same exact sample? Well, I took the chorus and I changed the amount and the rate just slightly. I also went into the actual sample and I pitched it down by 11 cents and I moved the start time of the sample. The original one is like back here. I moved the start time of the sample up. I mean, I think it looks like a good 10 milliseconds. And that was just enough to make it sound like they were two separate samples of the same sound, right? So together they sound like this. nice and wide. And that's kind of what I wanted here. And oh, I don't think I mentioned it, but these are pitched at the original pitch. So I'm kind of layering in octaves and also thinking about what frequency ranges I want these things to be taking up, right? To make everything sound full, because I'm trying to fill in the gaps of this main conch sound. So all together, they all sound like this. <laughs> Pretty fizzy and breathy on its own. It sounds a little bit weird maybe, but I think in context of this little tune that I wrote, um, it works pretty well. So I will go ahead and play the tune and you can hear what it sounds like in context. So yeah, I thought that was a, a pretty fun little sound to work on, actually. It was a nice little challenge. Um, nothing too serious, though. Not really a specific tutorial today, but I just wanted to go through and kind of show how I approach sound design and the way that I think about filling in gaps of sounds and layering sounds and kind of the process that I like to take. Um, if you hear anything else in this tune that you liked, any bass sounds or these little other weird small sounds or the drum sounds or anything like that, Go ahead and leave a comment, and I could definitely talk about those if you liked any of that. But yeah, that's going to be it for today's video. Like, subscribe, comment, do all those things, and I will see you next week. Peace.